Hi, my name is my name is Archit, and today I'll be talking about building out a strategic data capability. Um, I'll, I'll introduce myself properly in a second, um, and and also talk about some of the frameworks I'd like to use to discuss uh, this topic today. But in a, in a nutshell, what I'd like to do is kind of talk through what I've learned over the past few years working with some of the most data mature companies in the world for how they got to that point and, and what their plans are going forward. So what, what kind of team structures do they have in place to, to kind of move up and become, become these more data informed companies? And what kind of stack do they have in place and what kind of stacks have they iterated through and the kind of pros and cons of, of those different decisions? And, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'd like to share some of that information back to, to see if, if anyone finds it useful. I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts on it and, and please do please do share back um, any, any of your learnings and, and do feel free to ask any questions at the end. So a little bit about myself. My, my name is Arjit and I currently lead the solutions architecture team at Snowplow. Um, maybe it's, it's worth just quickly introducing Snowplow itself and then my job there will make more sense. Snowplow is a SaaS company um, and we have a, a product which is an enterprise grade data delivery platform. Snowplow essentially lets you collect event data, user behavioral data from different sources like website, your mobile apps, um, email opens and clicks, uh, web hooks, and IoT, anywhere where a user is engaging with one of your products and, and pulls it into a unified stream in real time and loads it into, um, into a data warehouse of your choice so that you can build kind of build your reporting and actioning systems off the back of that. And that's all hosted in the in, in, in the user's cloud account, so in, in the customer cloud account. And so what I do at Snowplow is help to onboard new customers. So um, that involves things like helping to design the tracking, helping to design custom solutions like an anomaly detection system or fraud detection system, content recommendation engine, uh, marketing attribution model, all of those things kind of designing the overall solution and helping to build some of the SQL data models in the warehouse to execute on those. And so from doing a lot of that, I've, I've kind of learned how, how companies build a stack around Snowplow quite well. Um, but also previously at Snowplow, I worked in a technical sales role. Um, and when I was there, I, I learned how companies were, were building their, their stack without Snowplow in it. And, and so I'll kind of walk through what I've learned in both settings with you, but, but hopefully it will all provide, prove valuable. And so one of the key things I'll use to frame a lot of this discussion is, is the idea of data maturity. And so at one end of the spectrum, you have sort of low mature, low maturity companies where this is a kind of organization where decisions are made and then data is maybe used to justify those decisions. And, and actually those decisions are made based on, uh, based on the instincts of the people that work at the company. At the other end of the spectrum, you have these kind of data pioneers where, where data is, is served out to the organization so people throughout the organization can self-serve on data to, to answer their own questions and, and make data-informed decisions. Making data-informed decisions is, is an assumption that's made at these organizations. And then quite often at companies like this, uh, data is needed in order to, in order to provide a competitive edge against, against others in the industry. Um, so for example, you need to recommend content better and faster than your competitor in order to, to, to be a key player in the market. And in some cases, the data is actually commoditized externally. So you create a portal where you know, if it's a marketplace, the vendors in your marketplace can, can access behavioral data through a portal or something like that. So those are the kind of two ends of the data maturity spectrum. And, and I, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous process. With time, most companies today are looking to inch up this data maturity curve. And if we take any, any company right now, it's, it's at some point in this, on this data maturity curve and the decisions they make will influence how quickly they rise up it. So what point in that bracket do they fit? And the things, the things that influence this the most, um, aside from obviously top-down vision and buy-in for, for using data at the organization, when we just look at the data team itself, the key things that influence this are the team that's in place. Like what, what is the distribution of resource within that team? 
um, are there are there Python skills, PySpark skills, SQL skills, um, analytics skills, uh, skill sets, communication skills, and so on. So what what is the distribution of those skills? Is it is it well proportioned? And then when that team hits bottlenecks, are processes put into place to open those bottlenecks up? Is there is there is there a good culture around that? And then is a tool brought in to help in those processes? Not is a tool brought in to solve a process problem, but is it brought in to help execute on a process? And so those are the kind of things that I'd like to talk about in the next um, in the next ten or so minutes, and talk through different stages in a in a company's journey to move up this data maturity curve, and talk about the stack and the team structure they have in place there. I'd like to I'd like to start with that that point. And and I'll talk as I go through uh, six stages that a company typically or might go through. Um, I like I'll be talking about the data lifecycle. So where you track data from your sources, your website, your mobile apps. It's collected using some system and then stored in a lake or a warehouse, and then modeled in some way, and then reported and acted upon. And then the, the, the teams on the right-hand side are the ones that are typically involved in this data lifecycle and that I will touch on in the next, in the next few minutes. And a quite, quite a big disclaimer here. Um, I, I will have I, I will be listing tools on the screen. Um, these are not it's, it's not about comparing or recommending tools um, in any way. It's it's actually just talking about um, the, the key idea, which is building a team and a process that works for the problems that you currently face, and then implementing a tool to maybe solve some of those problems. And it's very much my kind of personal opinion here. Uh, so please do take any kind of tool names with a pinch of salt, and hopefully you'll take away the bigger message, which is. Um, how the, the different problems a company faces as they move through this this data maturity um, move up the data maturity curve. So the first of six um, stages that I've got here, uh, and and this is kind of how a company might move up the data maturity curve. And so when a when a company starts with with data. Um, or starts in general, quite often the first tool they've got in place is a full full stack package analytics solution. Um, the most obvious and popular one is GA because it's free and there's a it, it's a set standard. There's a lot of help you can also get externally for GA. And here GA is performing all the functions in the data lifecycle. It's collecting, storing, modeling, and reporting on the data. And that's that's going straight to a human, typically in the marketing and product organization to make. Uh, make decisions about your business. And so at some point, a business needs to needs to move past this as their data stack. And, and the key thing that, the, that's the catalyst in this is that GA is a, it, 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 it's, it's a tool that's built with certain assumptions uh, that make certain assumptions about your product and about your business. And at a certain point, um, you're not willing to accept those assumptions and want to impose your own opinion on the data. Um, so let's say GA is, is very good for e-com businesses, but maybe your uh, your business that, where your product is focused on increasing engagement by by encouraging engagement with content. You're maybe a publishing site. In that case, at some point you'll want to pull data out of GA, and maybe the like the easiest first thing to do is to pull it into Excel, pull out some report data into Excel, and build your own reports off the data um, where, where you don't want to adhere to some of GA's opinions and you want a bit more flexibility. Again, typically this will be individual contributors throughout marketing and product teams that will, that will pull the data out into GA, model some assumptions in, and, and report on that back and maybe make their own decisions based on some of the data. But there's no kind of company level organization. There's no kind of data strategy set up. Um, and, and as this grows with time, there's more and more individuals who might set up a process like this. And, and it becomes clear that actually there's value in pulling data out of GA and, and, and using that to inform decisions. So at some point, the company will make a decision to hire a, a dedicated data professional. And maybe their first thing, their first big task is going to be to say, right, I want to pull 
data in, I want to make a company-wide strategy and pull data into some kind of data where, database as well. So maybe they choose Postgres to start off with, and they look to pull in web data from, from GA through, through the API into Postgres, the session level data, and this kind of transactional data from, from some backend system that they're pulling in via Stitch, maybe some Google Ads data or, 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 or similar data sets, and pulling it all into Postgres. And then they will write um, SQL queries to, to not necessarily model, but, but to, to work on that Postgres data. And maybe every day it'll populate a, a dashboard and I've put on the screen Redash, a free BI tool, um, while this is all quite experimental in early stages. And that will allow humans throughout the business and marketing and product to make decisions alongside what they're still self-serving from GA. But this is, this is quite a big step. This is the first time some a dedicated data professional has come into the business and decided to unify the data into one place into this Postgres. Um, and, and we've definitely seen companies go through, go through this phase. Um, and hopefully over time, the, the value in this is proved and, and there's more and more people kind of relying on this data. And actually the bottleneck becomes at some point, the fact that this is, um, the Postgres to Redash stage is not actually that performance. It's it's just this it's this analyst writing SQL queries that are growing increasingly complex, and actually it's becoming the system of things held together by duct tape and you know sped up with WD forty rather than this um, this this quite efficient and 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 robust data pipeline. And so maybe a next step from there is actually thinking about a data model, and so. Um, one, one, of the, one of the tools in the space right now that's, that's gaining quite a lot of traction is DBT, where you can kind of plug into a data warehouse, um, Redshift the classic, the classic or the, the first, um, first data warehouse that made it easy to democratize data um, throughout an organization. Maybe those are the choices that someone goes with to say, right, I'm going to pull in all the data from the different places, maybe some mobile data in through Firebase, that's why the dotted line, um, into web and mobile data into Redshift, behavioral data, transactional data still from something like Stitch or Fivetran into Redshift, then maybe this, this central data person is going to model it. They're really going to think about this data model, how to, how to think about this as a product and, and really impose decisions in a really deliberate way to get that raw data and turn it into a set of derived tables that the business can use. And this is a really, really key switchover point because you'll notice that this is the point where analysts, so marketing and product teams are no longer really self-serving from the GA UI. They've moved past that. The, the analysts that came in and built up that previous system proved so much value in making custom assumptions on the data that actually the business couldn't go, didn't see enough value in self-serving from the GA UI. They wanted all their data in these custom dashboards. Now there's this process set up where they go to the data team, ask for a new report and it's built. And this is actually a far more scalable setup. But at some point, that process of going to the data team, asking for, um, asking for information, the data team serving it to them, becomes um, means that the data team itself becomes a bottleneck, and maybe that's just one or two people. So maybe the next step is to make this, you know, create this better self-serve capability, and maybe you'll get in a tool like Looker for that, this kind of enterprise BI tool, which which is far more flexible. You can write LookML models, you can, you can do a lot more drag and drop analysis. And actually the DBT models that you build actually become, you, you optimize for building the best tool to allow self-serve ana um, analysis in, in Looker rather than building our dashboard straight away. And that's what humans are using to make decisions. And maybe at this point, you've got a lot, you, you've got you know, some, some engineering resource hired into the data team. There's maybe been a funding round at this point that the senior management has really seen the value in data and they build out some kind of homegrown logger to get web data, put it into S3, write some Python, uh, do some Python transformations on it and build an automation. Maybe it's a, it's a fraud detection setup. Maybe it's a, you know, it's a very custom kind of, kind of use case that required some more, uh, you, you ran a POC on it because it required some, some more custom, custom logic that you wanted Python for. And actually that home-built logger proves some important value. It proves that this kind of low latency data captured in a completely custom format was really valuable and that flexibility is, is really important. So 
so so so maybe that leads on to to bringing in a tool like snowplow which is just kind of enterprise grade data collection where you start really focusing on that that key piece that's furthest upstream collecting really high quality data from all these different sources web mobile webhook putting it all into the same place and streaming it in real time and loading it into a data warehouse where you can you know maybe you choose snowflake as a data warehouse more scalable um decoupled compute and um and storage you run some models on it you've got automations running off the back of that and you've got this data mart where where people can sell serve in looker and you've got data going into a kinesis stream or you've got some kind of streaming solution set up where you do streaming modeling and real-time actioning to proving significant business value of course you've still got stitcher 5 trying pulling that data into the warehouse and and this whole time we've been talking there's been these changes in the data in in the in the team structure below um and you've got these kind of marketing and product moved to the far right hand side and and you've built in these new data teams this data science capability and data engineering is kind of owning that whole stack up front and analytics is imposing significant opinion on the data um, and these are really interesting changes and, and the changes in stack have to be mirrored or have to be as a consequence of those changes in team remit and and skills and and this this might this might not be the end of the data maturity curve it's it's that there there may be places you would go uh, after that but this is a this is an interesting point to to pause um, at least for, at least for the purposes of this discussion and again i'd like to point out that the things i put on the screen were just examples there's so many tools in the space in each of those categories um these were by no means recommendations but just things i've seen quite quite often um and there's there's some really nice literature out there this by anderson horowitz and um, their view of the data stack that was actually released um, fairly recently. And, and it's quite interesting. They've got this, they've got uh, slightly different representations to, to what I had. And I think the interesting one is the, the inclusion of uh, a data lake in parallel to the data warehouse. Some really interesting discussion there. Uh, probably not enough time for it today though. And I'll just leave this up on the screen as, as, the, last, as the last bit where looking to the future, I think, I think the warehouse is really, or the data lake, uh, is going to become a really key piece. It's going to become this hub of the, of, of um, organizations everywhere to allow you to impose this opinion on the data. And, and maybe there's going to be these new tools that come up. There already are that allow you to, to, to build automations off the warehouse with, with no code or very little engineering. Um, and, and I think real-time reporting and actioning is going to become far more important as companies look to build a competitive edge. Um, and, and something that's already happening quite a lot is renewed focus in data modeling and SQL data modeling with tools like DBT, Dataform, um, Holistics, all kind of um, entering the space. And I think we'll see a lot of evolution there. But yeah, thank you for, thank you for listening. And um, where I ran through that quite fast, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions now.